thanks so much for having us. Uh, it's always nice to be part of these, uh, these seminars and these events where we can all kind of get together and collaborate and all kind of share ideas and, and, and come together. So we really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. As you just mentioned, my name is Curtis Thrush. I'm with One World Architecture. We're a firm just right down here in downtown Louisville. Um, and sure, yes, we do residential work. Uh, we also do larger institutional work out of state. We're, we're really kind of a pretty diverse uh, body of work that we tap into. So I'd like to think that um, we approach each project with a very unique perspective. And it's not just about one particular housing type. Um, one thing she did also mention that I want to touch on again, Every one of us in our office, each individual, were all LEED certified. So sustainable and green design is something that we're really passionate about and we really take quite seriously. And I don't know if you're familiar with the LEED system, but it's an acronym. It stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. So that's kind of a quick intro to who we are and what we do. Before we get really deep into the shotgun in particular and really get into the details, I, really, I know sometimes these seminars people like bombard you with information, you get a lot of, of statistics and a lot of facts. I really want to try and keep it simple and really kind of establish a foundation and a framework as to why are we even talking about this and is this really important? Does sustainable design really matter? I mean, if we really want to be good stewards of the planet, should we really focus about recycling or should we really worry about transportation? So I wanted to throw this statistic at you here real quick. In terms of energy consumption by sector in the United States, Residential and commercial buildings, essentially our built environment, accounts for 41% of our energy consumption. That's an incredible number. That's tremendous to really think about. And that gets into everything from uh, new construction, renovations, additions, and even ongoing maintenance and, and building operation. So if we're really focused and if we really care about really making an impact and living more uh, responsibly, more sustainably, our built environment is, is a critical issue to address. So again, I'll have a, a few real quick kind of big picture issues to really kind of establish the, the framework for why we're here. So the first one I really wanted to touch on is this idea of urban infill and how the shotgun specifically addresses this idea of urban infill. Um, the, why this is so critical is um, many times in, we have these established neighborhoods, these beautiful, gorgeous, historic old neighborhoods that really promotes walkability, already has all these amenities, these great shops and restaurants and, and, and amenities that people always enjoy. And when you do focus on urban infill, you're plugging into existing neighborhoods that are already existing, right? And sometimes you have to really be careful with this kind of suburban sprawl, I guess is the new term that's come up. Not only is it just the home, the new home we're building, but it's the new roads, it's the new transportation, it's the new utilities, it's all these things that we're continuing to dump our time and money and resources into when, in many cases, all that stuff is already there. It's just a matter of tapping into it. So the other thing, and I guess the, the other big, the scary uh, trend that's been kind of coming on in the last several years is this idea of bigger is better, right? And so if we were to look at the definition of, of an unsustainable path, the average home size roughly 40 years ago, about 1,600 square feet. The average home size nowadays, we're getting close to 2,700 square feet. Just in 40 years, it's a 62% increase, right? So if we were to see this as a chart, all of a sudden that would start to skyrocket. And, and it kind of begs the question of, well, what's next? I mean, five years from now, 10 years from now, is everyone going to be living in 8,000 square foot homes? 10,000 square foot homes? I mean, where are we going with this? You know, and, and at some point we have to start to kind of go, wait a minute, is bigger really better, or is bigger really just simply bigger, right? So one of the challenges, specifically with shotgun, is how do we create these spaces that are beautiful, functional, economical, in a more condensed space, right? And maybe we don't have the luxury, I, I certainly don't have the luxury of building a 10,000 square foot mansion, right? That's not, not in, in my immediate future. So how, how do we do this in, in an efficient, economical, and beautiful way? And I guess this is a continuation of that concept, this idea of quantity versus quality. When we do kind of get ourselves in this situation where we're building these 10,000, 12,000 square foot homes, we only have a certain budget, right? We have a limited budget. So when we're building so big, all of a sudden we find ourselves kind of cutting corners and, well, maybe I don't have that nice wood floor. I really need to do this cheap wood floor because I got 12,000 square foot home to do it in, right? So whenever you really do focus on more quality and it is these 
efficient, economical homes, you can really start to afford to do some nice things, right? It's quality versus quantity. So the last kind of big picture issue I'll really touch on before we really start to dig into the shotgun home specifically is this issue of building beautiful and long-term versus quick and cheap, right? And, and maybe this is some of my own personal bias. This is a gorgeous home in Old Louisville. This is a neighborhood that's just right outside of downtown. And this is not cheap to build. I'll give you that, absolutely. But my own personal bias. This is gorgeous, gorgeous work. This arched entryway. This is a carved stone window transom. I mean, when people built like this, it was built for the long term. People wanted to be here, and they wanted to be here for a long time. This house is over 100 years old. It's in a neighborhood that's over 100 years old. People value this. People really care. And I don't want to come up here and say, hey, we should build things beautiful. Wouldn't that be great? I know that sounds trivial, or maybe that sounds a bit contrived, but when you build something beautiful, people really value that. And people really care for that, and they'll care for that in the long term. Quick and cheap, I, I guess all I would say is, if we build that way, I guess we should just be prepared to have that built work be treated as such, to be treated as, well, quick and cheap. And, and again, quite honestly, it gets back into this issue of if we build something quick and then say, well, you know, we'll tear it down in five, ten years, build something again, we really need to think about what that's doing for our resources, our energy, and all of our, really all of our resources, quite honestly. Feel free, please, interrupt me. Uh, if you have questions or comments, please just chime right in. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep rolling along. So the shotgun, <laughs> specifically. Um, as much as we would love to take credit for all of these innovative ideas as being completely original and completely something that we came up with on our own, the reality is <clears throat> a lot of these passive systems, passive systems have been around for a long, long time. And one of the great examples we like to look at here is, well, there's this idea of the central courtyard, right? And these old Roman homes, when they were built, if you notice, it's this kind of donut configuration, right? It's where you have all these spaces that encircle the central courtyard. And look what's happening here as well. You have this kind of central courtyard with all these spaces built around it. So why is that important and why is that a big deal? Well, immediately, you, each and every space has this direct connection with natural light, breezes that are already occurring on the site, and it's just a, a bit of an issue of a quality of space. I mean, I would live there. I'd live there in a heartbeat. Are you kidding me? Hang out in the courtyard? Wouldn't be bad. Wouldn't be bad. Um, this, this building type, a lot of times, you know, we, we recently entered a competition to where the entire building site was 20 feet wide. Our home that we had to build was 17 feet wide. The lot was 150 feet long. So when you have these kind of constraints, imagine you're in a shotgun, right? I typically have windows in the front and windows in the back, and I'm caught in this big shotgun of a house. But look what happens whenever you start to carve out a space in the middle. Now all of a sudden, all these spaces around you, you have this immediate access to this outdoor spaces. You get natural light. You get the, the, the breezes that kind of come through. It really kind of taps into this quality of life that, that we're talking about here. I forgot to mention, I would, I would have been amiss if I didn't mention this. Also notice those clever Romans. Look, look at how all these roofs are sloping inward, right? You see what's happening there? And I know this graphic isn't that big, but you see this tiled area there? What's that all about? That's a pool, right? That's a fountain. So these Romans, what they would do is they would collect this water so and <coughs> discharge into the fountain. And so now you have this beautiful water feature that's happening naturally, right? I mean, it, and so that's what we're talking about, about passive systems. I love solar panels. I love geothermal systems. I love all these uh, high-tech, sophisticated pieces of equipment, but it's, it's, I think it does a lot of good to talk about passive systems, tapping into things that are already happening, collecting the rainwater. Water falls from the sky for free, so let's tap into that, right? And so we're doing the same thing here. Notice um, our roof slopes down. We don't have a downspout in this particular graphic here, but it's a water cistern, right? We're collecting the water, but we're also using that as a, as a water feature. Right? And so what happens with evaporative cooling, when these breezes do come through and you have a water feature, some water that's already there, it's catching that moisture and carrying it through these spaces so it's naturally cooling these spaces. So the same thing that's happening here in our shotgun. So I love to travel. I love to travel. And one of my favorite places is Charleston, South Carolina. <clears throat> and it's 
it's funny, when we were doing the research for this presentation, a lot of these cities kind of had their own version, you know, Boston, Philly, New Orleans, Charleston, South Carolina, they all have this very similar type of housing type here. So what they would do, they would have these long, continuous porches, typically that would be on the south side of the home. So why is that important? Well, what's happening here is the solar angle in the summer, depending on exactly where you are, the coordinates, where you are, the summer solstice, that solar angle is about 70 degrees off the horizon, right? So it's coming in at a, at a, at a much higher angle. And so what they would do here is you would get the sunlight, you'd get the natural light. It would bounce off. You notice a lot of times these are built white. So you get that light kind of bouncing off and getting into these interior spaces. So you're getting the natural light, but you're not getting direct sunlight through the windows and you're not picking up that UV, that radiation. So it's not contributing in the summertime when it's already hot, you're not continuing to contribute to that heat gain. So how does that translate into our shotgun? We have these really ample, these really large roof overhangs that are doing the same thing. And notice we have these strategically placed windows that occur directly under the roof. So again, you're getting this, this, this natural light, but you're not getting the heat gain. So it's really crafty, really clever, because also in the wintertime, the December solstice, that solar angle is much more shallow. It's only 23 degrees or so off the horizon. So when you have these same windows in the wintertime, when it's cold, that's exactly when you do want that solar heat and when you do want that sun to penetrate deep into your home. So again, that's kind of what's going on here and how it translates to our, to our shotgun. Same graphic, this, this kind of, um, this continuous porch really does both. That you have the solar orientation, but it's also about natural ventilation. And again, we're still focusing on passive systems, right? Things that are happening naturally. So notice, I don't know how well you can see here, they have double doors marching all the way across this house. Now, do you really think they need a double door every time to get out to the porch, right? I mean, couldn't they just have a smaller door or maybe just one door? What's happening there, look, that's relatively narrow. And so you have a narrow space and you have these double doors all the way across. What they do is they open all these doors in the summertime. I'm sure if we looked at a, at a shot at a photo on the other side here, you'd have corresponding openings on the other side. So pretty easily, you get this beautiful, this great natural ventilation, this airflow, this movement throughout the house. Back in the day, I'm sure they didn't have super efficient air conditioning systems, so that's kind of how they dealt with that. So the same way, um, we, we've been showing a lot of renderings here. I thought it'd, it'd be fun to show an earlier conceptual sketch here. In the same way, we're promoting that same kind of cross ventilation in the shotgun. A lot of these homes are really narrow, so quite honestly, it's not that hard to get this cross ventilation, right? And I don't know, as architects, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, sometimes we're a little funny, we're a little weird, right? And we think of buildings as living things that breathe, right? That take in air and exhaust air as a living thing. So we all know hot air rises, right? The heat and hot air rises. So again, getting back to those strategically placed windows directly under the roof, those can then open up and let that heat exhaust out. Right, all this is kind of happening naturally, just from smart design, guys. It's all this is. It's just smart, pretty cool architects coming up with stuff like this, right? And if you bring in fans, you're not bringing that air comes down and comes up. Some good stuff, guys. Some good stuff. So this is all kind of coming back to creating this quality of life. I would like to think, <clears throat> and, and I know what you're thinking probably too. You got these shotgun homes, right? Some of these are only 17 feet wide, only 20 feet wide, and 100 feet long. Is that really a good, do I really want to live there? I don't know, that feels kind of cramped, right? One thing that we, that we try really hard to do is to create these beautiful, open, fluid, multi-use spaces, right? So uh, we'll get into some floor plans here a little later on. But you're getting these spaces that are wide open. 17 feet may not, feet, may not seem like that, but let's count ceiling tiles. 4, 8, 12, 16. So you talk about a floor plan from here to that wall. It's a nice, beautiful, open space. And you're telling me I can make that really wide and long? Some gorgeous, nice, open spaces. And I love to compare that. <clears throat> I love to compare that with some of these spec homes that just ramble on and on forever. And you're like, I'm going to get lost in this home. Are you kidding me? This is crazy. I guess I would pose the question, because I need... I need four galleries, right? That's what I need in my home. I need all these galleries, right? And I need to, of course, everyone has their own billiard room, right? You kidding me? Oh, I have my own billiard room. So I would pose the question, 
I'm, I'm poking fun. <coughs> I would pose the question, look at all these interior spaces that are just kind of gobbled up and are kind of lost in this house. How do you get natural light into those spaces? Fiber <laughs> right, exactly. How do you get natural? How do you get fresh air into those spaces? <clears throat> so the easy answer, the obvious answer is, well, you don't. Right? You're trapped in these little bitty boxes that are buried in this beast of a house. So you're trapped in this little box. I now have artificial light, and fluorescents aren't bad, but a lot of these lighting systems they generate a lot of heat. So Awesome, great, I'm trapped in a box. That's what I want, I want more heat on me, right? <laughs> so now, I have heat already, at, I mean, could you imagine the, the mechanical, the HVAC system to, 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 to have to cool this house? This is not a simple little window unit you stick on the side of your house. This is a monster of an AC system, right? And oh boy, I just generated a bunch of heat from all that artificial light because I'm stuck in one of these boxes. <laughs> so now we have these monster mechanical and HVAC systems that we're getting in this, you see a theme here, bigger, more, I need more energy, I need more resources to, to, to cool this house. And I guess the argument we're making here, guys, is can't we do this smarter? Can't we be more efficient? Can't we be more economical about this and let these things happen a bit more naturally? <clears throat> so I also wanted to kind of get into some of the materials and really kind of dig into some of the details. And I know we have some great presentations coming up where we'll talk about specific building materials, so I won't, I won't, um, I won't steal any thunder, but I do think it's important. And you know, bat insulation is a common material that's, that's used throughout. So I'm, I'm not here to tell you you got to use this and don't use that. But I am here to say let's evaluate all these materials and really kind of understand the pros and cons of using each. So in a lot of spec homes, um, they use these bat insulations, which which is okay. It, it, it does its, it does its thing, but a it's not a continuous insulation. It's caught. It's always interrupted with either roof joists or floor joists, right? So this thermal conductivity, you're getting in the, in the winter time, you're getting the cold air, the, the cold temperatures that are kind of transferring through all of these framing joists, right? And you're also, bat insulation, I won't get too deep into this, but bat insulation, it does its job because it encapsulates air, right? Like a wool sweater, right? Well, if you've ever imagined wearing a wool sweater and getting that wet, all of a sudden, that wool sweater is just a wet piece of cloth that's hanging on your body, right? Well, whenever you have a home that may not be constructed perfectly and has moisture coming in, all of a sudden you have bat insulation that's full of moisture. It's really not doing its job anymore, right? So other materials, other building products that we really promote and we really love to see the use, one is uh, spray foam insulation, right? And again, I won't bore everyone with the science and with the, with, with the details here, but it's a spray foam that, that, that expands on contact and it fills all those little gaps, all those little crevices, so it essentially creates a very efficient, very economical building envelope. Another product we love to see is SIPS. It's a bit of an ice cream sandwich of a panel, right? You have continuous insulation in the middle and you have your plywood in the end. This is a crew of guys that's totaling up probably about a good chunk of the house right then and there. It goes up really quick and easy. You have continuous insulation so you don't have all these gaps and all these breaks and crevices. Uh, I, I'm not here to be a salesman for any of these products, but again, I am here to kind of let's look at the efficiency and the, and the advantage of, of one or, or the other. You know, the other thing we really love to do is use natural materials and use materials that we really can kind of connect with. And, and everyone seems to be a big fan of wood, right, of wood siding. Uh, one thing that we really love to, to use and promote is this idea of a rain screen. And so what this is is... Oftentimes, siding is installed directly up against the wall, right, directly in the substrate. And when you're installing that siding, you're driving holes every time through your air barrier and every time through your, through your moisture barrier, right? So what do you think that's doing to that moisture barrier? Each one of those nail holes is perfect, right? There's no air infiltration happening there, right? <laughs> so the rain screen, what's happening is this is the siding, and it's held, there's usually furring strips, vertical furring strips, right, that's on there, and the siding is then attached to these furring strips. So why is that a big deal? What's that doing? Well, for starters, it's creating a drainage cavity. Look at this. Now you have to use the right kind of wood, a clear sealed cedar. Gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. And wood, a lot of these wood species, they'll last. They'll really last a long time, but they have to be allowed to dry. You know, materials start to break down and decompose when they're wet and they're not allowed to dry out. So this drainage cavity, uh, again, kind of allows these materials to breathe and to dry out. Another thing that's happening here is 
you can imagine the summer, if you have the sun beating down on a material all day, every day, there's a, a certain amount of heat transfer that's happening too. If that material is held directly up against something else, that heat is transferring in. This also allows that water, that, that, that heat, to kind of breathe and to kind of escape. So again, it gets down to details, but these are the little details that we really dig into and that we really like to promote and use to kind of really make things a bit more sustainable. Okay. Final and PD, I'm sorry, go ahead. The firing strips, how are they on there so that they're not poking they, through? <laughs> and, and at some point, they, they, they are poked through, but, but you can install those at like four feet on center for each firing strip, and it's not two feet on center for every piece of siding. So yes, at some point, you do have to anchor it and attach it back to the substrate, but it's not happening near as often. And again, we, we really try and think about there's this term cradle to grave when you think about any kind of material. You have to think about, sure, I have this, this siding that showed up on my job site, but you have to think about where did this come from, how am I using it, and where will it eventually end? What's the end of its life cycle? And so any vinyl PVC siding, it doesn't biodegrade, but it looks so gorgeous, right? It's beautiful <laughs> stuff, right? But this stuff, when it goes in the landfill, it just sits there, right? It, it just doesn't, it doesn't. To tell you what, you what about the foam insulation and what about outgassing from it? About foam insulation? Yeah. They, they are using, and again, I'll, I'll let the specific reps kind of speak to the, to the details of that. But. So roofing materials, again, this may not be the, the most exciting thing to talk about, but um, <laughs> we do promote kind of the use of, of a metal roof versus kind of asphalt shingles. Essentially, the asphalt shingles, it's a petroleum-based product. You're looking at a, at a shorter lifespan metal roof, certain metals, you can recycle it, you can melt it down and form it back up. It never loses its structural strength, right? And, and, and you can get warranties on roof for quite a long time. And, and our particular shotgun, this is a duplex in that same uh, competition that we worked with. Um, this is a duplex. Each unit is 1,500 square feet. The total building is over 3,000 square feet on a 20-foot wide lot. It's 100 feet long. Um, but it is, a, it is a prototype. And if you notice, we have these roof sides that, that are sloping in different directions. And the reason why we're doing that is we acknowledge and, and realize that this is a prototype. And honestly, you never quite know exactly where this is going to be built. And we want to leave that potential open for wherever this is it has those south-facing roof slopes, so it can always accommodate uh, solar panels. If, if you know, we love to talk about sustainable features and uh, you know, whether it's solar panels or high-efficiency mechanical systems, but one of the things we really try and promote, there, there's the passive systems, but the other thing we really try to, to create are these sustainable features that we can really connect with and we can really kind of engage with as part of our daily lives. It's great to have a solar panel up, stuck up on your roof, but Unless you knew about it, maybe you never even see that solar panel. So we really try and think of these doing multiple things. Sure, there's a roof garden, right? And, and, the, and green roofs, and if you're familiar with that, they do a lot of great things. They protect the membrane. There's a certain insulation value there. And I mean, come on, you kidding me? Flowers on your roof. How beautiful is that, right? So it, it just in and of itself, a, gr a garden, a green roof is a great thing. But if we can install it then as part of a vegetable garden on your rooftop, or create this great little kind of oasis to escape to, to where you can enjoy that and grow vegetables there. You're, it's doing multiple things. And again, these are sustainable features that we can really kind of engage with and have a relationship with. Um, we talked about kind of evaporative cooling and having these water features. Maybe it's just me being crazy again. I don't know, but how cool would it be to have a water feature that's in a koi pond? Just thinking about this in, in new ways, and maybe there are multiple things we can do with these water features, right? Again, are you all familiar with the term shotgun and why it's called a shotgun, right? I mean, typically you can get on one side of the house and fire a shot and it can travel <laughs> straight, straight clean through the thing without hitting any walls or anything else. But we have tinkered with a lot of variations of the shotgun, right? You saw the duplex a little earlier. There's a single family. Uh, here again, we have this roof garden. There's a two bedroom, two and a half bath. <coughs> and, you know, it doesn't have to be a single family permanent home. They work out great as rentals. I think it's a, there's some great potential and a great opportunity there to have this as a vacation home. Um, and again, you know, we, we touched on the duplex. 
the total building we did for that particular competition was over 3,000 square feet. Each unit was 1,500 square feet, two bedroom, one path. So, I mean, if you, if you design it well, you can really get a lot of use out of that. So again, kind of getting back to this floor plan, and this may illustrate kind of what we were looking at before in terms of that central courtyard, right? You have this really <coughs> long, skinny home, but you have this kind of nice, common open areas, this kind of living, kitchen, dining area. You have this great kind of central courtyard that all these spaces can kind of engage with and connect with. And then in the back, you see these kind of two bedroom, one full bath units. This is the duplex. It's really identical floor plan that's just kind of stacked. And then, of course, we're going to tinker with this, right? I mean, it can't just be a shotgun. We're going to play around with the components and the parts and pieces. And once you understand all these parts and pieces, you can really start to have fun with it, right? I mean, you notice this looks a whole lot like that shotgun you saw before. It just has kind of a kink in it. Same type of thing. We can customize this thing in all kinds of different ways to fit a number of different clients, project sites, different conditions on the site. But, it's, uh, but again, all these kind of common themes are still there, whether it's natural air, natural ventilation, solar angles, nice open, fluid, flexible spaces, all empty out to a courtyard. Again, looking very similar to that Roman house we saw earlier, right, where you have the central courtyard. And so we've even taken this a bit beyond the shotgun because we readily acknowledge maybe the shotgun is not a good fit for everybody. And if anyone's good at marketing, I'd love to hear a better name for this. We call it the cube house, and maybe just by <laughs> default because that's just kind of to a certain degree what it looks like it's roughly the same length and width um, but relatively compact we've we've looked at models as large as or common in four bedroom three and a half bath and again you see these kind of common themes happening again and again you see these kind of connections to outdoor spaces you see these roof gardens you see these roofs that collect the water and deposit it into water cisterns. You see these great kind of open loft spaces. And I'm sure when you see, wow, you're telling me a four bedroom, three and a half bath house, I bet that's cramped. I bet that feels kind of tight and kind of claustrophobic. But we, we really try hard to create these conditions to where you have these nice, beautiful kind of open loft spaces. And again, hot air is rising. You have these strategically placed windows to where you can exhaust this hot air. So our, our, our goal is to really make this efficient, compact, but beautiful and good quality place to live. Go ahead. Do you have the cube house? Mm -hmm. Something of that design, what would the square footage be? That's a great question. Um, I want to say the cube house, we had that at, I, I want to say that was still under 3,000 square feet. 2,400 square feet, 25. I can get you exact numbers on that later on. So for the windows higher up mm -hmm. to be open to, to vent, what's, what's that How do you process? get to that, right? <laughs> uh, different window manufacturers have, have crank systems to where you can operate it from. And, and today, depends on how much you really want to spend on a window. They, you've seen those operable fans that have their kind of own remotes. They have windows like that too. I, I, I've gone as far as, um, there's a company out there now that will do skylight systems. And these skylights can be hardwired into your mechanical systems. So when the mechanical system, when the, when the thermostat registers, hey, wait a minute, it's getting pretty hot, these, these uh, sunroofs, these, sun, these skylights, then automatically operable, and they open, again, to kind of let the building breathe. So there are ways to where you can access that, yeah. So one of the, one of the last slides we'll have here is, again, you know, we had another client that kind of came to us and said, so I have a double lot in Butchertown, in, in Butchertown Louisville, historic area. And this is not intended to be any kind of really pretty picture, uh, but it is, I thought it was interesting to kind of throw in the mix here to talk about the kind of versatility of, of the shotgun as a housing type. Uh, this particular client came to us and said, so I have this double lot, what can you do for me? You know, I'm into rental homes, how many rental units can I really get on here? So for a small kind of double lot, shotgun lot, we got one, two, three, four units with a full garage underneath. And you see, so this is looking at the front from the street, this is kind of looking at the back. And honestly, we could have packed this a bit further if we really wanted to, but there are certain um, limitations you have from the building code as to how big uh, your green space relative to your uh, buildable space, right? So we, that's about as much as we were allowed to do. You see these common themes again and again. All these units have this kind of central communal courtyard, again, promotes natural air, breezes, that kind of thing. And a sense of community. I, I, you know, I think that's gr a great point. You know, um, in, in these, some of these developments, we're, we're so concerned with, this is my yard, this is my area, and this is mine, leave me alone. Which, uh, some people like that, and, 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 that's, and that's great. I don't want to tell people what they should or shouldn't like. 
but I think um, we need to also kind of get to the point to where we can have these healthy mixed-use communities to where you know people are living in closer proximity to each other and we, we promote this sense of community yeah, absolutely I think it's a great point so that's really about it guys that's what I got <laughs> Yes. Sorry for the interjection earlier. Oh, this. please, <laughs> please. Um, uh, question about your design. Mm -hmm. you're very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Looks very you. cutting edge and progressive. How do you promote that with clients that are usually stuck with old world looks? Mm -hmm. No, that, that, that's a great point. Um, <laughs> we're always very. If you notice that that study we did before, um, and again that wasn't intended to be a pretty picture, but you notice we did have those nice pitched roofs. <laughs> We did have, I think you have to, in, in historic or more conservative context, you absolutely have to be very sensitive to that. And, and you have to really, um, and I would, I would challenge that a bit too. I don't know if I'm thoroughly convinced that from a design standpoint, when everything looks the same, that means it's good design. Like you see these developments that everything is going to be very, very similar in how it looks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, you know, I... You need to be respectful of your context. You, I just think there is a different set of criteria you can adopt to evaluate that. And I think it, it needs to get a little deeper. It's not like, well, this guy has a white porch, so I'm going to have a white porch, right? And that guy has red shutters, so I'm going to have red shutters. That's good design, right? Well, okay, it, there's something to be said about that continuity. But I think there are more important criteria to think about. How, does, how do these homes really relate to the street? I think might be a, a more important or... or, or a, a deeper thing that may promote a bit more thought. Do they complement each other? Do they complement each other? And and I've seen, and, and so, guys, look, I get it. This is modern, and, and it's a bit out there. I get that. We're trying really hard. We, we're really using the same kind of siding. We're using the same kind of, this has a front porch. We have a front porch. This has a certain kind of window, punched window system. We have the same kind of punched window system. I know that this roof is a bit different, but it's still a pitched roof type of scenario that you see here too. So I think there are things that, again, I'm not thoroughly convinced that if everything looks exactly the same, that's good design. I think we need to be very sensitive to that and, and I don't want to come in and say, oh, well, let's just build whatever you want because I'm not, I'm not there either. I just think we need to be very um, sensitive to, to your context, but you can do that in such a way to not just mimic what's around you. You know, because uh, we do, we get a lot of people that come to us and say, I want a craftsman because Back in the day, I grew up in a craftsman house, and ooh, I just have a warm spot in my heart for it. And that's great. You know, I think, I don't like to use the term style, but there are certain kind of languages of, of building. Um, but I think if you notice, I mean, you can have a deep roof overhang with all kinds of different roof types, right? And, and, and you can have the central courtyard with all kinds of different housing types. I think it's important to, um, to keep in mind that, that you can do all these things and still kind of meet those clients' expectations. It looks like in rainwater, it's the interior court of your house. How do you deal with high rain years where you may not mm -hmm. have enough collection space? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times from a sustainability standpoint, the, the goal is often to keep that water on the site as much as possible. Because as soon as you dump it into a sewer, now you're treating that water and all of it. So I have seen systems that um, have dual shutoffs. They'll contribute, and even rain barrels, I've seen even just simple rain barrels. So once that rain barrel is filled, it will begin to divert that water off and even have a drip irrigation system into your yard. Um, There's some statistics out there that say in suburban developments, up to 30, over 30% 30 of water use goes to irrigating your yard. That's crazy. That's crazy drinking water that we're just kind of throwing out into the grass. And yeah, we need to irrigate our lawns. I love green grass, I do. <laughs> but we can do it in smarter ways is all I'm saying. Thank you guys. Thank you.